from his studios in New York. It's time for Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. Here's your host, Dan Tortora. Called Life. Hope you're having yourselves a fantastic morning this morning as we are starting here a little bit later this morning, typically 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. But this is ACC kickoff week and we have a lot of different things going on. So always happy to be here with you where sports meets that thing called life inside of these Cafe Kubal studios. And you know that Cafe Kubal comes to you on 3501 James Street, 324 West Water Street, 401 South Salina Street all in Syracuse, as well as on 343 Fayette Street in Manlius, New York. And they are also at their drive through location on the corner of Route 11 and Taft Road at Sweetheart Corners in North Syracuse. So make sure you get out to Cafe Kubal today and let them know that Wake Up Call sent you. With that being said, always happy to be here with you every Monday through Friday on YouTube.com, Facebook.com, and MixLR.com, all backslash Wake Up Call DT, as well as on Facebook.com backslash live now DT and on wakeupcalldt.com's homepage. So however you're connecting with the show, we thank you so much for being here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. We got an awesome show set up here for you today as I am very, very excited to officially kick off our week with ACC coverage. So we're kicking off the ACC kickoff here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. And I'll be down in Charlotte, North Carolina, covering all 14 schools. For the last time, we'll see divisions. And so it'll be very interesting to be down here with a lot of things looming in the background. And my guest to start off the week is going to be Carl Haywood. Comes to us from CSRA RA Press Sports in East Central Georgia. He's been covering Georgia Tech football since 1979. And he has been covering ACC football since Georgia Tech joined the conference and he's a member of AXMA, AS, AACSMA, and uh, very, very much appreciate him being here. He's been with AXMA since Georgia Tech, joined the conference pretty much, and his going into sports coverage for his 43rd year. So over four decades of covering sports, of course, Georgia Tech and the ACC from CSRA Press Sports. That is Carl Haywood joining us here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets that thing called life. So with that being said, let's bring him in, as I'm always happy to have Carl on the show. Carl, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Dan. Appreciate the invitation to be on the show. Thanks for this being your 10th year anniversary. That's good. Yeah, and, and thank you. Yeah, I mean, coming up this uh, Wednesday, July 20th of 2022, Wake Up Call will be celebrating, well, Wake Up Call, Super Powered Pop, Comic Book Trails, Dan on Disney, everything we do. Dan Tortora Broadcast Media is celebrating its 10-year anniversary, so the entire family is going to get to celebrate, and I'm very, very excited about the opportunity to do that. So thank you uh, for mentioning that. For those kind words, we'll have some fun stuff set up here for the uh, 10-year celebration. So a lot of great stuff coming. And hopefully some good stuff is coming for the ACC. We're waiting here in this in this game of what's going to happen with realignment and whatnot. But I'd love to, uh, first and foremost, get your thoughts, Carl, on, on what you think about what's happened so far. You know, you and I talked about what I saw happening when the Big 12 had its head cut off last year with Oklahoma and Texas saying that they're going to leave by 2025, if not sooner, there was this reality to me that the Big 12 could have gotten poached, the Pac-12 could have gained, got to the Pac-15, the American, the ACC, the Big 10, all would have been involved along with the SEC. That didn't happen. And the Big 12, I wrote an article recently here called From Almost Death to Wild Rebirth. So since the last time we talked, there has been more movement The Big 12 responded to their head being cut off by taking BYU, who will leave the West Coast Conference in all sports except for football. They will no longer be independent in football as they'll join the Big 12. And the American will lose UCF as well as Houston and Cincinnati. From there, 
The American Athletic responds to losing three by gaining six. They go to Conference USA once again to bolster up their conference, and they'll be taking Rice as well as UAB, UTSA, North Texas, and FAU will all be joining the conference there for the American Athletic. And then we saw the Big Ten cut off the head of the Pac-12 with USC and UCLA. So as realignment has continued, the last time we spoke, we thought they were the biggest chips to fall. And now here go UCLA and USC. What are your thoughts? Uh, it's, it's really wild. Uh, it's hard to imagine that na- what we thought was going to be strong. We talked about it last year. And what we thought was going to be strong, now the Pac-12 is in real trouble, <laughs> the way it looks. Yeah. And uh, uh, in reading some other writings of other people about what's going on over there, uh, that just leaves Oregon and Washington as the stronger teams with the biggest draw, and their, their draw is not big enough to be picked up by the other conferences. So they, <clears throat> they're hurting. Um, I, and I'm really surprised after we talked last year, uh, I'm really surprised that the ACC didn't really make a move. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, you know, and, and that's that's definitely something that, that I've been talking about and actually had, you know, a conversation this morning with a buddy of mine. And, you know, I said the worst action right now is inaction. And there's there's five quote-unquote power conferences that the media have dubbed that. I, I did not, but, you know, that's, that's what they're known by. I call them the autonomy group because that's the actual legal legislative term. And when we take a look at this, this is the ACC, the SEC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, the Pac-12. And the Big 12, as I, as I said before, the SEC cut off the head of the Big 12. The Big Ten cut off the head of the Pac-12. They didn't just go after teams within those conferences. They, they took their identity. The SEC took the identifiers of the Big 12 when they took Oklahoma and Texas. When the Big Ten went to California and they poached, They took from the Pac-12 their identifiers, USC and UCLA. Oregon, you know, has its moments, obviously, and Stanford has moments. But, you know, we're really looking at the fact that USC and UCLA, especially right, you know, being right there in California and the markets that they have and and bringing really, really big uh, markets, you know, out out of the state of California, not just the state, but where they're coming from with these schools. So, you know, my thoughts on this is, you see two conferences cut off the head of two other conferences in the autonomy group, and the only other one of those five is the ACC, who hasn't cut off anybody's head, and they haven't had their head cut off. Well, if the Pac-12's head is gone, and the Big 12's head is gone, and nobody's going to cut off the head of the SEC or the Big 10, then the ACC's only move is to do something to a conference, but none of it's going to hold the weight. The only thing that the SEC or that the ACC can do to get to the front of the newspaper, essentially, the only thing the ACC can do to get to the top of the headline and to be the headline is to get Notre Dame to join in football as they've joined in every other sport. There is no other giant chip that the Ameri- that the Atlantic Coast Conference can do because if they do some weird thing with the Pac-12 and they get Oregon. Yeah, it's great name, and it's Phil Knight, it's Nike, it's, you know, 400 different jersey uniform opportunities, but at the same time, it doesn't make any logistical sense for them. Not that the Big Ten and the USC and UCLA makes any logistical sense when you got teams that'll have to travel like 2,300 miles to get to each other, but in the Atlantic Coast Conference, I believe that as two conferences got stronger and two conferences got weaker the only one left out of that power five is this this oddball, right? There's an odd number of autonomy group teams and, and the oddball out is the ACC. And I think the only move that they can make to become the story in America is to get Notre Dame to join them in football. Well, yeah, I agree with you, but I don't see Notre Dame joining them in football. And I Notre, Dame, Notre Dame and uh, defy in that area negotiating their own TV contracts. And uh, I don't see them joining. If there's a chance for them to join the Big Ten, which is one of the plays that the Big Ten is trying to make, I don't really see them trying to to join the ACC in football. 
and the Notre Dame joining the ACC in basketball hasn't helped them that much. Uh, they want to be in if they if they're going to drop the their own TV contract and go with a conference con- TV contract, they want to be in with uh, one of the biggest they can get. And the problem, the real problem that ACC that I see that the ACC is facing is because they didn't take any action. Yeah. Now, the the Big Ten and the SEC are looking to poach Clemson, Florida State, Miami, North Carolina, and Virginia. And what is, where does that leave the ACC? <clears throat> right. Um, and if you, you're talking about Oregon and Washington joining the ACC, well, you know, that kills the Atlantic Coast Conference because now you're Atlantic and Pacific. Um. I don't know of anybody they can. I, don't, I mean, I don't know a big draw that they can get to get into the Atlantic Coast Conference. Um, I, and I, I don't know the possibilities of them picking up West Virginia. Um, but yet, how much of a difference does that make in your in your market share? And you're looking at um, what I read about Oregon and Washington. Other conferences are not really looking to them to ask them to join because they don't bring in but eighty to a hundred million dollars. Well, that to us that's big money. Yeah. But in major college football, that's near not near the bottom, but in the middle. So they're not gaining a whole lot by picking up Oregon and Washington. The other conferences are not. Now the ACC might, but um, it's. It's a combination to me. It's a combination of the the conferences doing their realignment and picking up everybody they can. It's a combination of NIL getting involved, and it's a combination of television calling the shots. Yeah, you know, and, and I think I, you know, and you're absolutely correct in this respect. And I, and I want people to really take a look at this and understand that. There are no, I don't believe in coincidences. I don't. And and so in my life, I call them God incidences. And I think in, in the sports world here, if you take a look at where things are, when did Oklahoma and Texas say they want to join the SEC? 2025. When is Notre Dame's contract up with NBC? Around 2025, 26. The college football playoff doesn't have a future contract after what? the 2025, 2026 range. So Notre Dame, Oklahoma and Texas, and the college football playoff all have open season around 2025, 26. And for people to think that this was all hap- happenstance and that this was just like a happy accident, that it's there's no way, shape, or form that this is the case. When Notre Dame is renegotiating, that's when Oklahoma and Texas are joining the SEC, and that's when the college football playoff committee has to figure out what their future is going to be and if they're going to expand. So, you know, to, to me, as we look at the college football world, nobody should be surprised that we are where we are right now because we are where we are right now because this was set up to happen. Realignment doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen by mistake. And, and so, you know, when you look at all these moves that are being made and how these moves are being made and when these moves are being made, you shouldn't be surprised to look at something like this and say, oh, okay, you know, like, the, you know, these are the teams that are moving here at this time, and this is the time that this conference is going to be up on this, and this is when that's going to happen. So, you know, I mean, to me, I really just think people need to follow the bouncing ball, and they need to understand that the world of collegiate athletics, there are powers that be that are constantly working together, and I think people would be crazy to think in any way, shape, or form that, you know, the TV industry isn't involved in this, that they're not talking through this, that they're not trying to figure this out and together trying to work out a plan that makes sense because this doesn't, again, just happen. In the college football playoff, you know, to look at the expansion and the thoughts of expansion and what was supposed to happen That went through, it was supposed to go, I think, through four different series of meetings and events. And it went through, I believe, three of them, and then it stopped. Well, why did it stop? 
And it stopped at a time where Oklahoma and Texas announced that they're leaving for the SEC from the Big 12. And so it didn't really start up. It's been quiet since then. And then we see USC and UCLA. So for people to not really just sit here and realize the fact that we're living in the world that we're living in today because this world has been coming, it's been rolling toward this, and if anybody thinks that the TV stations are not involved in this, then you're really not paying attention to the fact that everything halts at the same time, everything starts up at the same time. There's a reason why things are happening the way that they're happening, and I think it would behoove people to start paying attention to the fact that these dominoes all seem to be falling together and they all seem to be coming up at the same time. Contracts seem to be here at the same time. There is no coincidence in what we're seeing right now. I agree with you 100%. But also add, at least what I see, and I've seen it coming over the years. It used to, when when I started covering Georgia Tech in the late 70s, it was still newspaper print coverage mostly. Television was big, yeah, but not as big. Uh, and over time, it gradually moved to where television took over more and more mm-hmm. and became more and more popular. And then the Internet came in, and then it was Internet and television. Well, now college football is controlled by ESPN and Fox Sports. They own the contracts to these conferences. Yeah. If you look at the schedules of practically every team, there may be two or three games for the schedule for the whole year that already have the kickoff time set for them because they're already locked into a night game on a certain date or or whatever. But the rest of them are TBA, TBA, to be announced. And you don't know the kickoff time until Monday before the ball game because TV sets it. Yeah, you know, and I – as as somebody who's in you know this world of you know multimedia and and owning a multimedia company being a broadcaster covering these games i get very frustrated and i spoke with a a team before i, I spoke to the athletic communications department before and i said you know like what's going on with the schedule because i was trying to figure out if i was going to go to this game and it was within driving distance like 4 or 5 hours from me and I heard back from the school, from the institution. They're like, well, technically, we don't have to tell you till Thursday. And I was like, the game's on Saturday. Like, I, you know, how are you supposed to get, if you wait to buy a plane ticket on Thursday to Saturday, that plane ticket might go from 150 bucks to 500 bucks, and they don't care that you're paying for that. And then you look at the fact that I was like, okay, well, it's the difference between a noon game or an 8 o'clock game. If the game's at 8 o'clock at night, I'm not going to go. If it's a noon game, then I can drive there and drive home. I don't want to get a hotel. So I'm sitting here saying, well, can you just tell me if it's going to be noon or 8 o'clock? Like, can you ballpark it? And they're like, well, technically, we you know, we can give you the information the week of. And even then, we can wait until three days before the game. And and I just thought that that was just so disrespectful and ridiculous to put people in the media that are covering you, that are doing you a solid, that are helping you get your name out there, that you're making us have to wait and spend more money, more time, more energy, and not be able to set a plan for the rest of our weekend because we're waiting on you, and you're going to tell us Thursday morning about a Saturday game to me is is idiotic. I agree. And when I, when I started into it, every schedule every year before the season started, had every game marked when kickoff was. You you had a schedule and it had the time and the date of each kickoff for the whole season. Then it gradually got to where uh, you had the ESPN Thursday night game set ahead of time. You had um, the Saturday games timed. And then television started setting, okay, we're going to play this game at this time and this game at this time. And then it got to where it was, well, we're going to wait and see now because we've been, we schedule these teams for the whole season at this time. But then one of them fell apart first part of the season. And we get later in the season, they're not going to draw that much traffic because they're not part of the competition anymore. So now we're going to wait until how they played on Saturday and what they come out in the polls Yep. And we'll determine which 
team is going to kick off at 12 noon, which one's going to kick off at 12.30, which one's going to kick off at 1, which one's going to kick off at 2, which one's going to kick off at 3 or 3.30, which one's going to kick off at 6, 6.30, 7, 7.30, 8, 10, 10.30, 11. Yeah. It, it, it's going to change every week because they're going to determine where the teams stack up and how they're going to draw television traffic. That's why Oregon and Washington are not that big of draws. And these other teams, and, and this is just my opinion, but in these and what I've seen happen, yeah. and these other teams in the ACC that are not being courted, like Georgia Tech, Duke, um, they, they are academic schools. And they don't have that big of enrollment every year. They don't have that big of alumni classes. Now, I, I did read one reporter listed all those and said, you know, Georgia Tech d- doesn't have that great a college football tradition. Well, they're wrong. <laughs> Georgia Tech has one of the longest college football traditions of any school in the country. And, and, and yet they've been relegated to, well, they're just an academic institution and – they're not that good in football, so we're not we're not going to put them up there to where we can poach them and get them because they're not going to draw us that much money. So you're going to leave them yeah. and a couple of other schools in the Atlantic Coast Conference, and what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? They're stuck. Yeah. And with the agreement that the ACC worked out with ESPN to finally take the ACC network. Do you remember those negotiations that they had? That it got put off a couple of years before they finally launched it. Yeah, and then it, and then it's they, turned into just a such a not great situation. And, and I was just and, and again, I was having this conversation this morning. Syracuse fans are up in arms because Syracuse fans used to be able to watch Syracuse basketball and football games on three, five, and nine. NBC, CBS, ABC, they were able to watch these games. They were able to watch them if they didn't even have cable. And I can't tell you how many families have said to me, Dan, I have watched Syracuse for decades. I live 10 minutes from campus and I can't watch the games and I'm not going to buy the ACC network and cable is outrageous. And then you have to always buy an extra package and I'm not doing it. I mean, my father is what 60 67 years old and my dad is is a huge Syracuse fan always been a Syracuse fan and he refuses to buy the ACC network he said if the game's not on I'm not watching it or I'm going to a friend's house but I can't tell you how many people have felt have felt completely ostracized and closed off because the ACC said to them Thank you for watching all these games over the years. Now you have to pay more money just to get a piece of this. And then sometimes the feed goes out and then it blacks out. And then sometimes it's, you know, it's not working properly. And I see Syracuse fans all the time say, why can't I watch a game? And there's, and, and when, if the ACC says they can't do it, it's not true. Because there's other conferences I've talked to, and I think it was the Big West. And when I was speaking with Tom Wistersell, the big, the big West commissioner, him and I were talking about the fact that they made a deal with ESPN to carry their games and put them on ESPN Plus or whatever. And the deal with ESPN also allows the local television networks to pick up the games. So they don't discriminate. So they made a deal with ESPN. They got their games on ESPN, but they're also allowing the communities where these schools are to be able to watch the games and I don't understand why that hasn't been made available or why people that don't have cable, why the ACC network hasn't simply made an app. And I know they work with ESPN, but make make an ACC app, charge people $8.99 a month or whatever, and let people watch the games because this, like, so many people got rid of cable. So to, so to get cable back when you just got rid of it because it costs you 80 bucks for no reason, then you got to spend extra money to get the ACC package. You put all that in there, you're spending almost $100 a month just so you can, in Syracuse, watch, what, 30 games a year between basketball and football? I mean, it just seems it seems fiscally irresponsible, especially in today's world. And I can honestly say that the ACC network has really, 
really hurt the people of Syracuse, New York specifically. And I could speak on that because it's my hometown. Right. And, and at the same time that they were negotiating the uh, ACC network contract, one of the reasons why they, they told us at the ACC meetings that it was delayed was because some of the cable companies wouldn't take the channel. Yeah. And you, you couldn't, because they could, they said we can't get enough people to subscribe to it. So we can't take the channel. Well, what do you mean? We're the ones giving you a, a set of ball games that you're going to get a revenue out of, but oh, we can't get enough subscribers. So they tell us to go back and tell our people to be sure and get your cable subscriber to pick up the ACC network. Well, Okay, we did that. Um, I take the ACC network, uh, and um, but in that same time, they negotiated contracts with the schools that made it virtually impossible for the schools to leave the conference. You you got to pay millions of dollars just to leave the conference if you choose to to bow out because of the contract negotiated with ESPN to carry the ACC network. They wanted those teams locked in. And to go back to what you were saying uh, about not the co- there are no coincidences and all these things are coming up at the same time in 2025 and 2026. Uh, I, I go back and say I see Notre Dame going to the to the Big Ten, yeah, uh, and because they're not getting the, their contract was with the NBC for years, and they negotiated their own contract. Well, they're not drawing that much traffic anymore, but they will draw the traffic because uh, you know they can't being like they are in college football, they can't win a conference championship. And they'll, the ACC let them do it two years ago because of the, the virus. But they can't win a conference championship. They've got to be able to be in a position to either win a conference championship now and then try to get into the to the uh, national championship picture, or they've got to be in the national championship picture every year in order to meet the goals that any new contract they negotiate for football is going to pay off because those networks now they want big money. The advertising revenue they draw for college football is astronomical, and um, and a lot of these young people, because of the the way I see it, and you know, I listen to um, Coach Sweeney at Clemson, talk about it last year at the ACC kickoff event where uh, uh, he had voiced his uh, opposition to it before it was actually put into to, uh, operation. And some reporter asked him, well, I see that you have now changed your position on NIL and you now, you know, working toward it and all that. And he said, well, I don't know where you got your information from, but I haven't changed my position on NIL. I'm opposed to it. He said, but the conference and and the NCAA approved it, so I got to live with it. And I got to find a way to deal with it. And you're talking about giving these young men contracts of $500,000, $750,000, a million dollar contracts. They're 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old. What are they going to? Who, you, he said, we got. We had to put in a class to help with these young people with the possibility of what you're going to do when you get this money and how can you manage it and take care of it and do it the right way. And that uh, the quarterback at Clemson, Ungalay, he signed a contract, uh, a big NIL contract last year, and they helped him work out a plan or whatever. But we saw the difference in what it does to a kid, or at least the way I look. He didn't. He didn't perform. He didn't. When he got out there on the football field, he was to me. He was not the same player he was the year before. In a way, he played like 
I, he was cautious. I don't want to get hurt. I don't. I don't want to be where I'm knocked out of the game because I've got a contract and I'm supposed to be on the field. Yeah. And, and not only does it do that, but Coach Sweeney said the same thing. If you're not careful and you don't work your team the right way, it it creates a division among the players because it's a lot of kids ain't gonna get a contract. So yeah. they're out there. Okay, I'm supposed to go out there and do everything I can for the team to win, for two people on the team to have these multi-million dollar contracts. It's Coach Winnie said it. He said, I honestly think that if we don't watch out, if we're not careful, money is going to kill college football. We won't be college football anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and big money, television, big money, whatever, internet, whatever, big money is going to kill college football, and it's going to be, it's going to make it semi-pro ball. Yeah, you know, and and listen, that makes perfect sense with what's going on, right? You can't call somebody an amateur that's making money, and now you know NIL is trying to creep into high schools. It's, you know, into New York, into Pennsylvania areas and whatnot. And, and what, it's, what it's doing now is you're telling a kid, a kid, a, a young kid, 14 years old, 15 years old, you can go make money on your name, image, and likeness. And, you know, I just, I look at this and I, and I see the, the negative side of NIL because I went to interview somebody. Now, when they came on to the team, they were, they were in the transfer portal. And they came onto the team and we did an interview immediately, like within three days of them transferring to the school. And we had a great conversation. And then when I saw him in person, we had a great conversation. And we continued on to have great conversations. And and then at the end of the season, they declared for the NBA. And I said, okay, well, why don't we do a show at one of the local restaurants that I work with? We'll get you out there in front of the community. You could say goodbye to everybody. You know, you could do it right. You know, I handle myself differently. So, you know, your message is going to be carried the right way on my show. And we're going to sit down. We're going to have a good time for like an hour. And I and I said, just out of curiosity for transparency, I said, are you looking for anything? And they said, yeah, you know, $500 would be great. And, and I said to the guy, I was like, okay, like I'll see what I could do. But, you know, you want $500 for an hour. And they're like, yep, $500 would be great. Now the team had a losing season. They didn't make the NCAA tournament. And, and, you know, this person had three, like three good games, like really good games. And not that they didn't have the ability, but it's like, you know, we had a, we have a friendship, we have a bond with each other. And then I said, okay, well, if the companies don't want to pay you $500, because granted they got to pay me to be there and all that stuff, but I'm running a business. And so I said, you know, if they want to pay you 500 bucks, they got to pay that 500 bucks on top of everything. I was like, I'm not paying it to you. I don't do that. And so I called some businesses. They loved the idea. The moment I told them it was 500 bucks, they were like, no. Then one company said, well, split it with me. I said, I'm not paying. I don't do that. I said, I've been a broadcaster for almost 19 years. I don't pay people to talk to me. If other people want to do that, that's fine. I want people to talk with me because they want to, and I want them to talk with me because of the relationship. I don't want them to talk with me because they got money under the table. So so I said no. And I went back to them and I said, okay, well, listen, you know, the businesses were interested in you, but they can't float the 500 bucks. And then they said, okay, well, then I guess we'll just do it on Zoom. Like now I'm not going to do it in person, even though we're friends, even though we built a relationship, I'm only going to do it on Zoom. And then they didn't even do it on Zoom. So that's the other side of realignment to me is it's like we built this friendship, we built this bond. They're so grateful for me talking with them as they're transferring. Then they ask for $500. Then the company's like, well, you give me half of it because I don't want to spend $500 on this person. I want you to pay $250. And then at the end of it all, it's like, well, let's just do Zoom. And then after that, it's like, well, let's do nothing. And and that's the ugly side of it to me. Yeah. And on top of that, in, in college sports now, it has gotten so to the point to where the big names at each school, each team, ESPN or Fox, whoever is carrying, whoever has the contract to carry those games, 
they're expecting those big name people to be on the field at every ball game because they are the draw. That person, that name, that number, whatever, maybe two or three of them on a the team, they are the draw to get people to watch that game. So they won't, they're going to tell the school, you better make sure these people are on the field. Because if they're not on the field and the people know that they're not going to play, a lot of people just ain't going to tune in. Yeah. So you, you drop in ratings. When you drop in ratings, you've got to drop your rate for advertising revenue. And that ain't going to happen. They're not going to let that happen. There's too much money involved. And same thing goes if a company or several companies have an NIL contract with a kid, a young boy, a young man, they're expecting him to be on the field playing. I mean, we've been invested a good bit of money in this person, but name, image, and likeness, well, his name might be on the TV, but his image and his likeness is not on Saturday. He's on the sidelines. Why isn't he playing? You know, and, and that's and that's something that I brought up. You know, and I brought this up at the beginning of NIL. And speaking here with Carl Haywood, here with us from CSRA RA, uh, Press Sports, and is covering the world of athletics for over 40 years now. We appreciate it so very much. Very close with Georgia Tech and obviously the ACC. You know, as as we look at this NIL side of things, I said this, and I said it to a student athlete at Syracuse who, you know, just graduated and went off, you know, try to make it to the NFL. And we were doing a show together, and he goes, I never thought of what you just said. And in my head, I'm like, how did you not think of this? But I said to him, I go, what if you're a quarterback and you got two wide receivers and they both have NIL deals and one of them's got a law off or let's say one of them's got Toyota, the local Toyota, the other one's got the local Ford and this Toyota and Ford, they like to fight against each other in general, right? They got an ego over here and an ego over here. And these guys have known each other since high school and they're always trying to outdo each other. So one takes wide receiver A, the other one takes wide receiver B. They give them the same contract, 50 grand a piece, and they're both playing at Syracuse. And they go, you got 50,000, you got 50,000. But every game you catch at least 10 passes, we're going to give you another we're going to give you another 10,000 for the for the games that you do that in. We're going to give you another 10, so there's an incentive. So at the end of the game, your team's down by 3 and you're trying to win this game. You're marching down the field. The quarterback gets into the huddle. Wide receiver A says, "You better give me that. You better, you better give me that ball." Wide receiver B says, "No, you better give me that ball." And they both make side deals with the quarterback and say, "We'll give you 10% of what we're going to make if you throw us the ball." Where does the quarterback throw the ball to? What happens if the ball goes in one direction, not the other direction? Does that Ford dealership call up and say, "I can't believe you're helping out Toyota"? Now does Toy- now does Ford? pull their sponsorship of Syracuse in general? Do they take money away from the school? What if the guy's a booster? Does he stop giving to one of the complexes they're building because now he's pissed off about that situation? How involved does a booster get to be? How involved does a business owner get to be? And do you really want two wide receivers in the huddle telling their quarterback, you better throw me the ball because I'm going to make more money. No, I'm going to make more money. No, I'm going to make more money. And does a quarterback want to deal with that at the end of a game? I... I thoroughly agree with you <laughs> and likewise having played high school ball and have been a lineman the poor lineman's not getting their contract right and he's sitting there i've got to protect this guy throwing the football yeah so that these two guys can argue about who's going to get the pass we're supposed to be out here as a team playing as a team to win the ball game whoever's open ought to get the pass you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah but yet, but yet, money has now creeped into it to the point to where it is corrupt in the system. And when you have those, to me, I've seen it happen in other places. Um, when you get to that point, you lose a big chunk of the team concept. Yeah. And football was designed as a team sport it's not you got 11 players out there either on offense or you got 11 on defense and they're all expected to do their job each individual is like a machine and that machine each part of it has to function like it's supposed to or the machine doesn't run right 
And when you've got uh, you've got one or two that have all the honors and all the this and and they get contracts of big money and you're not getting anything, but you are really uh, let's face it. If you don't have a good line in front of you, the quarterback ain't gonna have time to throw to either one or two. And he's gonna be running for his life. He's got a contract that he's got to protect his body and himself, and he's looking for an NFL contract. Yeah. Uh, you are you're killing the team concept and you're creating friction, just like in the case that, that you were talking about between players that there should be no friction there. It should be, okay, I'm going to look for whoever's open, and when, if you get open, well, I'm going to hit you with the football. Yeah. If you're not open, I'm going to the other guy, plain and simple, because we got to win this ball game. This is the team, not you. This is the team. And if the other, if, if your receivers take the attitude like you're talking about, well, I, I don't care whether I get open or not if you don't want to throw me the football. The team concept is gone and like you pointed out earlier, they're going back further and further now, and they're getting these kids in high school to do the same thing. And teams, team football in high school is corroding. And that's because a, you got one, you got one or two players that they are a you know, potential five star recruit, and colleges are going to see them and talking to them when they're in the eighth and ninth grade. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is like what I mean, what's what's permissible and what's what's impermissible now? You know, you look at all these coaches that couldn't text this player, couldn't talk to this player, this booster couldn't do this, you couldn't handshake and give somebody a thousand bucks. I mean, everything you would have gotten in trouble before for is now going away. So, by the way, you owe Jim Bayheim 101 wins to come back to him. Right, not I guess North Carolina never gets in trouble, but they didn't. They didn't get in trouble when they should have gotten in trouble, and now, you know that that goes by the wayside. There are no rules, and that's the thing. There's no central rules or regulations. There's nothing stopping anybody. And for the NCAA, I mean, for college football in general, for the world that we live in, for the NCAA to say, "Hey, we're going to have a temporary NIL deal where you all have to do it." At the time that that happened, if I am, I mean, based on the numbers and what I was looking at at the time, nine states had approved of some type of name, image, and likeness legislation. 41 other states were either working through it or didn't want to do it. And the NCAA said, well, y'all have to do it. Then the NCAA president, Mark Emmert, said, I have no control over college football. So I'm sitting here going, your president has no control over football. Then how does he suspend coaches and players? But he has no control over football. He can't control conferences. He can't control institutions. So what is his job and why is he getting paid $3 million? On top of that, you're now saying to the country that states don't have rights. And when did the NCAA become the national government? So I'm looking at this going, how is the NCAA not getting sued? How is the college football playoff not getting sued to turn around and tell states you have to approve of this? Because California said yes to it, you have to. Because Kentucky and Florida and New York are working on deals for this, you have to like it. If you're Nebraska and you don't want to do it, tough. If you're Idaho, tough. If you're Arizona, tough. If you didn't have something in place, they forced you to do it this past year with no rules, no regulations, no central body, no punishments, nothing. And if you're if you're going to take something like this that didn't exist and you're going to open it up and Pandora's box is open, you can't close it because nobody wants to abide by these rules now. You've already given boosters the opportunity to do whatever they want to do. These collectives have formed where you and I and a few other people can get together and you put in 10 million, I put in 5 million, Sarah puts in 20 million, Steve puts in 6 million, and Patricia puts in 14 million. And that all goes into a collective pool. And then that school uses that and says, okay, we got X amount of dollars to give to our student athletes, who are we going to give them to? It's used in recruiting. It's used in the transfer portal. It's used to bring somebody there. And now schools can literally call you up and say, hey, if you come to my school, I'll give you $3 million. So then you call the other school and they go, well, we can only give you $1 million. 
the other school says, well, we're going to do things right and we're not going to use this the way it's not supposed to be used for. So you punish the school that's being moral. Then you choose the $3 million school over the $1 million school. It's got nothing to do with ed- education, nothing to do with the coaches, nothing to do with the team, nothing to do with bonding, nothing to do with what state, nothing to do with where is best for you and your family. It only has to do with the fact that they had a collective that can give you $3 million. So the collective is a problem. Name, image, and likeness has no rule or regulation. Your president's stepping down. The NCAA is rewriting its constitution. It should say something to you that in a world dealing with a pandemic, NIL, and the transfer portal, and realignment, that the president of the NCAA is stepping down and the NCAA is trying to decide who they're going to be in the future. If they don't have an identity, then everybody under them doesn't have an identity. And if the NCAA doesn't know who they are, well, then guess what? It's open season. And if you think it's bad now, it's only going to get worse because the guy that should have been in charge was never really in charge. And whoever comes up now, do they really want to deal with all of the stuff that's going on today? Do you really want to come in and sit down and have to be the person to give rules and regulations and look like the bad guy? The NCAA let everybody do whatever they wanted, and now it's like watching a TV show where it's like fun with Dick and Jane when you walk into the office and people are jumping out the window, shredding everything and setting all of their papers on fire in giant trash cans. The NCAA has no idea who they are. They have no control. So why should we think that any one of the institutions in America has any idea what they're supposed to do or what they're not supposed to do? The people that want to break the rules can do whatever they want because there are no rules to break right now. You're absolutely right. And it goes back to the reason the NCAA president, in my opinion, in my view, the reason the NCAA president can't make a ruling or he can't go against anything is because there's too much money in their TV contracts. Yeah. And, and TV says, you're going to do it this way. If we're going to sign this agreement and offer you these hundreds of millions of dollars, you're going to do it this way. And that means these players, the big names, are going to be on the football field. They're going to be in that ball game. So you have not only did you destroy the the power of the presidency and the power of the NCAA, but you have now destroyed the hierarchy of of discipline and unity of the team all the way down to the coaches. Yeah, because you're going to get you're going to get to basically the same type thing you've got in the NFL where an NFL coach, he might make three, four million dollars. I, I mean, I don't know the, the, the highest paid NFL coach, but he's not making near what his highest played player is making. And he tries to tell this guy, okay, you need to go do this. And that guy said, well, wait a minute. I don't have to do anything. I've got a contract that says I'm going to get X amount of dollars. And I'm not going out there and killing myself. I make a whole lot more money than you do. And the people are coming here to see me play. They're not coming to see you play. You're just over here on the sideline. So I will do and put out the effort that I want to put out. Yeah. And that's creeping down into college football. And then it's going to creep on down into high school football. You are... You, you are ruining what was great college football. It, it's, it's, it's sad. It's sad to see it happen this way. And you're right. Uh, as I was coming up through high school and then, and then covering college sports, the, even the coaches were limited to the time that they could be with the players. Certainly, you couldn't have boosters spending time with them. Yeah. And you, you go back just a few years ago, you had boosters at the University of Miami was doing all kind of stuff with the players. They had them going to parties and functions and paying them to do this and paying them to do that. What did anybody do about it? Yeah. And now it's just a joke. Now it's just a footnote. Now it's just like, oh, well, that's the you. And if so, I mean, it's it's just crazy how some people get away with certain things and then other things nothing you know some people get away with it and then other people get punished 
Jim Beheim was was punished more than any coach I've ever seen in the history of basketball in America, maybe any coach at all in the history of collegiate athletics. And then I look at what happened in North Carolina, what happened in Miami, what John Calipari has done everywhere. I mean, it, and it's 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 insane to me to see that the NCAA is like, okay, well, if Dan breaks the rule, here's the punishment. If Carl breaks the rule, here's the same rule, here's a different punishment. So it's like, how does breaking rule one have nine different punishments? And if you're this school, there's nothing. If you're that school, there's something. I mean... I, I can go and I can I can talk about UConn. I can talk about St. Bonaventure, Syracuse, you know, different Louisville and whatnot. And and you see all of these different treatments for these crimes that have helped out and impermissible this and impermissible that. But why did this happen and that didn't happen? You punish all of the schools that John Calipari coached at, but you don't ever punish John Calipari when he's the one that did it and he's the common denominator. So... It's, I mean, the world of, of the NCAA, I said it five years ago. I said five years ago, my words, can people can go back and check the tape. Five years ago, I said, five to ten years from now, if the NCAA keeps doing what they're doing, they're either going to look vastly different than we know them right now, if they exist at all. My words five years ago where the NCAA is going to change if they don't change themselves and they don't change how they do business and what they're doing and how they treat people unfairly and all this stuff, it, this was before NIL, before the transfer portal, all of that. I said, if they don't change five to 10 years from now, they're either going to look totally different or they're not going to exist at all. And here we are at the five year mark and they're rewriting their constitution. Their president is stepping down and collegiate athletics looks totally different. So, and going by just what you said, a prime example is in 2009, Georgia Tech won the ACC championship on the football field. Yeah. Before the season started, there was a question about a player on the team had accepted less than $500 worth of clothes given to him from a person who was a friend of a family of a player. Georgia Tech addressed the situation with the NCAA and asked for a ruling. Okay, did we did he violate any rules and regulations by accepting this clothing? Yeah. Well, the guy he accepted it from had been a friend with an agent. So, yeah, there's a possibility. So they went through hearings, weeks of hearings, the whole time. Georgia Tech was trying to find out, okay, do we practice him? Oh, we don't practice it. Right. Got no ruling from the NCAA. So they practiced him. Came close to time to, to play. They were supposed to get a ruling. No ruling. Well, do we play him in the first game or we don't play him? No ruling, so they played him. He played the entire season. They won the ACC championship. Still no ruling from the NCAA until... They lost the Orange Bowl game. And then the NCAA ruled that, yes, it was a violation. So Georgia Tech had to forfeit their last three games of the season. Yeah. That meant the Georgia Tech game, the ACC championship game, the Georgia-Georgia Tech game, the ACC championship game, and the Orange Bowl game. Well, if he was in violation of the regulation, they lost the whole season. Why just the last three games? So they had to, they, the, then the ACC vacated the ACC championship. That's just wrong. If, if you're going to let all these others do that stuff, give Georgia Tech back the championship they earned on the football field. Yeah. That, I mean, and it's it's like, I mean, the Syracuse thing was egregious because you look at it, they took 101 wins from Jim Beheim, but they didn't take any of the losses. So in the season where they decided that Syracuse had broke the rules, in those seasons, they kept the losses and took away the wins. And I'm sitting here going, if the games don't count, the games don't count. So you're lowering his winning percentage. You're making him look like he won zero games in like three seasons. And what does that mean? You know what I mean? It's like if you play the game and you won, you play the game and you lost, and that person wasn't supposed to be on the court for that game, then the game didn't happen. They're not 0-4 when they were 31-4. and 
you know what they're they're o and o and that's and that's the way that it needs to be so it doesn't make sense it's ridiculous we're going to get into a few more things here after this fast break on wake up call with dan tortora here with carl haywood from csra press sports covering georgia tech and covering the greater acc over the years here we'll be back right after this fast break where sports meets life on wake up call with dan tortora inside of the cafe kubal studios smelling really good with these beautiful witty wicks candles and i have my summer in cuse one that'll be traveling with me down to charlotte we'll talk about that coming up this week we'll be back right after this this is a wake up call fast break Avicoli's, located on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York, has been your trusted neighbor for decades. Located just steps from Liverpool High School, we're happy to have the Liverpool Warriors on-site, on-location broadcast at Avicoli's through Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora every single month, featuring student athletes, coaches, and administration throughout the year from Liverpool High School. Head out to Avicoli's today on the corner of Route 57 and Wetzel Road in Liverpool, New York, open Tuesday through Sunday for lunch, dinner, and drinks. We'd love to see you out there. And of course, you can call them at 315-622-5100 for takeout, delivery, and catering. That's 315-622-5100. And also find them on myavicolis.com. That's myavicolis.com. Having peace of mind when you're out of town that your furry loving friend is safe and sound means taking them to Canine Campground because we all know that when it comes to the love of our pets, it goes well beyond the call of duty to make sure they're safe and sound. Right, Lily? So take a ride to 242 Johnson Street in East Syracuse, New York and see Canine Campground and where your dog will be staying in the classic cabin, the executive cabin, the grand cabin, or of course, the luxury cabin, because if you know Lily, you know she loves luxury. (laughs) Now you don't have to wait to the last minute to find a family member or a friend that'll take your dog for a few days. Call Canine Campground at 315-299-4013. That's 315-299-4013. Their drop-off and pickup times are Monday through Sunday. Check K9 campground.com for more information that's the letter k the number nine and campground spelled with a k dot com k9 campground.com when you're going out of town bring your dog to k9 campground PB&J's Lunchbox, the food truck that you love finding all throughout Central and Upstate New York, now has a street side cafe. So when you're craving their traditional favorites as well as their out-of-box amazing menu items, you can now head to 663 Old Liverpool Road in Liverpool, New York, located just minutes from the highway, the thruway, Destiny USA, and Onondaga Lake Parkway, PB&J's Lunchbox Street Side Cafe is there for you Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., serving breakfast, lunch, and and dinner all throughout the day. Get breakfast for dinner, dinner for lunch, whatever you fancy, including their award-winning grilled peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Find them at 663 Old Liverpool Road in Liverpool, New York. PB&J's Lunchbox, where we love to know what's in your lunchbox. As a patient, what do we want? To be cared for to be listened to, and to have someone walk us through the process on our path to victory. Victory Sports Medicine and Orthopedics does all of those things beautifully, with Dr. Mark Petropoli leading the team on 791 West Genesee Street in Skinny Atlas, New York, located minutes from beautiful Skinny Atlas Lake. Whatever your injury may be from head to toe, preventative care, rehab, physical therapy, laser therapy, and surgery are all available at Victory Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, where they care about us, they listen to us, and they understand that everyone's path to victory is a little bit different. Let them help you on yours by calling 315-685-7544 to make your appointment today. That's 315-685-7544. And find out more information at victorysportsmedicine.com. Carl. 
Carvel DeWitt. It's what happy tastes like. Do you know why? Because we make ice cream. Creamy, rich, flavorful ice cream. Not yogurt or iced milk like some of our competitors. Ice cream. Fresh, by hand, daily. For the calorie conscious, we have something new for you. Our new Carvelite. Same great flavor, creaminess, and texture of our regular ice cream with only 35 calories an ounce. So whether you want an ice cream cake, flying saucer, dasher, Carvelanche, hard or soft ice cream, we will satisfy your craving with our fresh, handmade, regular, or new Carvelite ice cream. Carvel DeWitt. It's what happy tastes like. Cafe Cabal offers same-day local delivery of our products, offering no delivery charge for Onondaga County. Shop CafeCabal.com for fresh roasted coffee beans, cold brew, travel mugs, and all your essential Cafe Cabal needs. Cafe Cabal, coffee for the soul. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is located on 3680 Milton Avenue in the Home Depot Plaza. It is your family-friendly sports bar and restaurant. Folks, some sports bars aren't family-friendly. Some family-friendly restaurants are not sports bars. The Wildcat Sports Pub in Camillus, New York, is proud to be both. It is that marriage that you've been looking for for years. The Wildcat Sports Pub is your home base for your sports bar and restaurant needs, games for the kids, indoor and outdoor activities, and enough things on the menu to come back every single week and get to try something new. They're open Sundays from noon to 8 p.m., Monday through Wednesday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Thursday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to midnight. For reservations and party information, call 315 315- 487-2222 for the Wildcat family-friendly sports pub and restaurant. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios where sports meets that thing called life. People watching right now going, Dan, did you just have a wardrobe change? I did. I have a whole team here. That, that dresses me and gets me set. No, I'm kidding. But we did have a wardrobe change because I, as you know, a wake-up call with Dan Tortora and Dan Tortora Broadcast Media are the exclusive multimedia marketing partner of LeMoyne College. And LeMoyne College and I, in our partnership, I am golfing in their golf tournament today. So my foursome will be out there at Tuscarora. So I had to get the, uh, the dolphin attire here and I'll be ready and set to go. Uh, looking very dolphin-esque this morning. So we did have a little wardrobe shift here in the studios, and we're continuing our conversation with Carl Haywood on the ACC and the greater world of collegiate athletics from CSRA Press Sports. And so happy to have Carl here with us. Uh, Carl, you made a point in hour number one, or or I should say in the the first part of this, this show, and what we did here is we talked, well, there's a few points that you made here, a lot of great points, and there's some points that you made. One of them was it was about scheduling, right? And not that back in the day, you know, you used to know how the season was, right? You could look to November and say, okay, this is when the game is going to be. Because, you know, if you want to travel as a family and you want to go, you want to know in advance. And I would want to know if I have kids, like, okay, am I going to bring am I going to bring my kids to the game on November 12th? Or am I going to bring them to the game on October 15th? That You know, let's look at times, let's look at schedules and whatnot. And so to to really drive your point home, there's 12 games that are played in the regular season for college football. And when we look at Division I FBS for Syracuse, my hometown as an example, their first four games have times. The other eight games, two-thirds of their season, don't have times yet. And it's it's crazy to me to take a look at this. Eight games. The last eight games of the season have no times. They're all TBA. We have... Wagner, NC State, Clemson, Notre Dame, Pittsburgh, Florida State, Wake Forest, Boston College, all to be announced. The only ones that are set are Louisville, UConn, Purdue, and Virginia. And the funny thing is, Virginia just had a time change. So the season hasn't even started yet. We have all these months leading into it. 
Of the 12 games that Syracuse is playing, four of them had times. One of those times has already been changed. And we'll see how, as you said, we'll see how teams look at the beginning of the year and during the season. Well, based on how Syracuse looks in those first four games, we'll decide if Wagner's going to be a noon game. What you know, Notre Dame might get some pull, even though they're going to be in Syracuse on when that game's going to be. But it's it's just ridiculous that you know TV has literally told the fans essentially here: buy your season tickets to Syracuse, come and see the Orange play, come see them on the road. But of the 12 games that they play, eight of them are to be announced based on what TV thinks of them a couple weeks into the season and then from there. That's the way it is now. <laughs> uh, it's, it's almost impossible to judge, particularly in our case, we had um, reporters going to Georgia Southern game. I would go to the Georgia Tech games. Uh, we had a reporter who occasionally to get to go to the Georgia games. But it would, to be, assign a person to go, you couldn't tell until Monday or Tuesday, okay, what time is it going to kick off? And used to, we we knew what time they were going to kick off. We could assign a player, person to go, and they could tell her, like you were talking, you could drive to it. Yeah. Okay? Well, if I'm thinking the Georgia game is going to kick off at 1, I'd drive early in the morning to the ball or get planned to leave early in the morning to go to the Georgia game. So I can be there plenty of time to have everything set up and get my camera equipment out and everything and be ready. And yeah, uh, they changed the Georgia game to 3.30. Yeah. Or either they, yeah, they changed it to a night game. Yeah. Well, well, now my whole schedule is shot. Yeah. But, but I don't, you know, I, I'm in the media business, but I'm in print media, and we don't pay to cover a ball game. Yeah. But ESPN pays a lot of money to carry a game, or Fox pays a lot of money to carry a game. Yeah. So, yeah, and all these schools, man, they're, they're getting really nice facilities. Every school is for all these players to attract the players because, like they say, in recruiting, when you try to bring a young man in to – to uh, recruit him and let him see the facilities. He wants to know what the best stuff you got. And he, if he's a highly rated recruit, he's going to go to the school that's got the best facilities. It's going to give him the best opportunity to show his talents and give him the best opportunity now to have a really good NIL contract and now to be in the first or second round of NFL draft. Yeah. And so these schools... And, and you said in the first hour that um, you made a really good point that these states who legalized the NIL contract and said, okay, you got to do it whether you want to do it or not. Well, the conferences did the same thing. When they signed a contract with ESPN for them to have the SEC network or for them to have the ACC network or the Big Ten network or Pac-12 network or whichever one, you got to go by the rules that we set for the conference because we're carrying the games and we're running your network and we're going to make sure we got the best games on at the prime times that we can get the best at red, at ad revenue out of it. Yeah, you know, and, and and we sit here and we try to figure out when all, and you know, and, and it's hard and, you, and people don't know this. I mean, I remember this will be my 12th year covering the Jacksonville Jaguars and God willing, I'll be on site on location uh, for this once again. And I had somebody say to me, they're like, oh, so Jacksonville, like, you know, the team pays for you to, to travel and they pay for you to come to the games. And I was like, are you, are you on drugs? No. I was like, they don't pay, they don't pay the media. They, you know, the media, they do a lot for us, right? They give us parking, they give us free food, they give us, you know, free drinks, they give, you know, they, they let you go in and, and interview their players and their coaches and whatnot. They give you access. And, and of course, you know, they give you a seat in the press box. So there's a lot of things that we get and I am grateful for all of them. I'm not one of those people that complains like, Oh, I get all this free stuff, but we didn't have bananas foster for dinner. So now I'm going to lose my mind. Like, I mean, I honestly think don't bite the hand that feeds you. And, but I think it's funny when fans think like, Oh, like when you go out and you cover the NCAA tournament, like Syracuse pays for you to fly, right? If they're going to be out in Idaho, they pay you to come out to Boise. No, when I had to go to Omaha, Nebraska, I could not get a flight 
to Omaha, Nebraska. I had to fly from Syracuse to Minnesota, then I or Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then I had to sit in Minneapolis and I had to wait. Then the only way I could get there was to go to Des Moines, Iowa, which is two hours away from Omaha, Nebraska, rent a car in Des Moines, Iowa, which I wasn't going to do, and after renting a car in Des Moines, Iowa, driving at least two hours to Omaha, Nebraska to get to the game a few minutes into the game being started. What I had to do to get there, I said, if anybody would ever question whether or not, you know, I love what I do and I do what I love, I went through all of that just to sit there for two hours. And guess what? As soon as that game was over, I did my interviews. I went back to the room. I put my work up on the internet. I was up. I barely slept. I think I slept three hours. I got on a plane the next morning and I came back to Syracuse. So... It was all at your expense. Right, and it's it's all at your expense. It's at your expense of your sleep. It's at your expense of your wallet. It's at your expense of, you know, doing things that you weren't planning on doing before. So people need to understand that. This isn't an easy thing to do. And just to give an update here from what I'm looking at for the NIL tracker, I want to let people know this. Um, after uh, state legislature adjourns uh, Arizona, the effective date, of them putting in was 90 days after state legislature. Arkansas passed NIL January 1st, 2022. California passed. California is the first one to talk about it, but they didn't pass NIL until January 1st of next year will be passed. Colorado, July 1st, 2021. Uh, Connecticut had an original bill July 1st of 2021. Amendment permitting the use of institutional marks is July 1st of this year, so that just happened. Florida, Georgia, Illinois, and Kentucky all passed it July 1st of 2021. Louisiana passed it on June 10th of this year. Maine passed it on March 31st of this year. Maryland will pass it next year on July 1st. Michigan will pass it on on uh, New Year's Eve of this year. Mississippi will uh, pass it on July 1st of 2021. Missouri, August 28th of 2021. Montana won't pass it until June 1st of ne- next year. Uh, Nebraska permitted it immediately, required no later than July 1st of 2023. Nevada passed it January 1st of this year. Uh, The fifth academic year after passage is what New Jersey has. Uh, New Mexico was July 1st of 2021, so was Ohio. North Carolina, July 2nd of 2021. Oklahoma said it was permitted immediately, required no later than July 1st of 2023. Oregon passed it July 1st of 2021. Pennsylvania passed it immediately. South Carolina passed it July 1st of 2022. Tennessee, January 1st of 2022. Texas, July 1st of 2021. Virginia passed it July 1st of 2022. And as you don't see in here is the state of New York that I'm in. So, you know, it's all over the place on when this was passed. So again, when the when the NCAA was like, you got to let it happen in 20, you know, back in 2021, look at how many states didn't have it. And California, who started this giant cluster, they don't. They're like the. They're like the. Some of the last people at the table. Yet they force the entire country to have to make a decision. So California affected all fifty states, or you know the other forty nine states, including their own. So all fifty. California affected the entire country, and they're not even the first one at the table. So, you know, nil's been crazy. And to go off of that and stay with money here before we jump into some ACC specific kickoff week. Here's some more information on the grant of rights, because a lot of those states I mentioned are already inside of the ACC, so they have the NIL deal. Now, the ACC's grant of rights, what it means is if a school were to leave the conference for another conference, quote, the ACC would get any media revenue generated from athletic events on its campus through summer 2036, end quote. What that means is that, quote, any departing school would forfeit its media rights and the ability to have home games and some non-conference games air on television in all sports through 2036. I want to thank Steve Wiseman as well as Andrea Adelson for their work in all of this. But to take a look at this, throw in the exit fees, and which, which stand at $120 million per team in the SEC, and that's a ton of money. The ACC paid out $36.1 million to each of its 15 schools, including Notre Dame, for the 2020-2021 fiscal year per The Athletic. Now, all of that money coming in here. So you would forfeit your, what is right now, thirty-six over $36 million a year. Plus, you'd have to pay a $120 million exit fee. 
And on top of all of this, you would forfeit. You would forfeit your money through 2036. How insane is that? And why did anybody sign this? That and 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 again, the ESPN made out in this deal. The ACC didn't make out, and the conference, the conference schools didn't make out. If they stay, they do. But look at how much power the ESPN has. If you leave the ACC and you go to another conference, you forfeit all of your media rights to the ACC. So if you're if you're Georgia Tech or you're Syracuse and you leave the ACC, and let's say you go to the Big Ten, you go to the Big Ten or the SEC or whatever, you leave through 2036, you you can't air your home games on television. You can't air your non conference some of your non conference games on television. And you're going to pay the ACC for not being there. So you're going to keep giving them your media rights through 2036 unless you negotiate this. So whether or not you're in the ACC, you're in the ACC essentially. And now the grant of rights is, it, it doesn't mean that it will go unchallenged. Somebody can go after it, but it would have to go through the courts and they'd have to try, try to find a way to get this all Correct. And, you know, Andrea Adelson, as always, you know, she does incredible work. So I want to commend her on, you know, describing the grant of rights here a little bit more. But that's the world that the ACC schools live in. All 15 of them, including Notre Dame for everything but football, if they were to leave before 2036, they would still owe all of their media rights to the ACC, gain no money, and so you would be playing games yet having no income, and you would black yourself out on television. That's in, I don't know why anybody would have signed that deal. Yeah, I, I didn't understand it either. Um, but, you know, that's why I'm not in the position of making those decisions. They don't want my opinion. Uh, but it, I, why you would sign a deal like that is beyond... But then that goes back to the ACC negotiated that. Right. So, so the teams had, the schools had to agree to it. If you want to stay a member of the ACC, you've got to agree to this. It's insane. And uh, it really, maybe some other schools can afford to pay it. But Georgia Tech can't afford to pay that kind of money to vote and go to another conference. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I, in listening to the a couple of sports announcers talking, uh, analysts talking, saying that, well, you know, not many uh, conferences are going after um, teams like Duke and Georgia Tech uh, and Syracuse and um, uh, Wake Forest and um, because they're more academic. They have a center on academics. They're good schools, Vanderbilt. Uh, they're not going to be poached. Uh, they may be, but they can't afford to buy out of the ACC. However, Clemson, if they offered the right kind of deal, they might be able to pay for it. Florida State might be able to pay for it. Right. Uh, and if you lose... Clemson and Florida State out of the ACC, where do you stand? What what kind of draw? I understand that Florida State has not had the record that they have in the past, yeah. but sometimes it runs in cycles, and they're going to come back. And I think when we when you were talking about the, um, the realignment, you also get into the new ACC 355 model, yeah. which I think is, in my opinion – a push by television to say, wait a minute, you need to get rid of the two divisions because the coastal division is not the stronger division. Right. Right. It's, it's dominated by the Atlantic division. Yeah. So you need to go to a system in which the two best teams in the ACC will play each other because we're not getting that for the ACC championship game. Right. Yeah, you know, and I mean, and it is, and it makes perfect sense. And, you know, it could be a draw to get Notre Dame in. There's there's a ton of things that are going on. Notre Dame is surrounded by the Big Ten. South Bend, Indiana is surrounded by Big Ten country. 
The SEC has stayed true to staying in the South. The Big Ten, outside of the California move, has stayed true to staying in that cloud right above them. And they take up most of the Midwest to the East Coast, and it leaves the whole West Coast wide open, which I think the mid, it would make more sense for me for the Mountain West and the Pac-12 to join together. The Atlantic Coast Conference is in danger of being pushed out into the Atlantic Ocean if they continue doing what they're doing. And let's be real about it. When it comes down to money, the SEC and the Big Ten, if somebody wants Clemson, they're going to go get them. And Clemson, to me, Clemson, Florida State, Miami, they're all viable in this. I think North Carolina is, but why would they give up the connection with Duke? But the reality of it all, to me, is you want to preserve rivalries. And you're about history and you're about rivalries, right? So in the SEC and in the ACC, the way the SEC is right now, when they balloon to 16. They're already at 14. When they balloon to 16, they're not going to be playing non-conference games. They don't have to. And their conference is so good, and you think about it, the SEC is going to lose those games. There's not going to be Clemson, South Carolina, and there's not going to be Florida, Florida State because they're not going to have a space for it. And that, to me, is going to make even more sense to say, okay, you know what, if you want to preserve these, we need to bring you into the conference. And the SEC, mind you, if the SEC gets Clemson, What is the college football playoff every year? It's Alabama, another SEC school, usually Clemson, and then fill in the blank. And Oklahoma filled in that blank for many, many years. Oklahoma's going to the SEC. Alabama's in the SEC. That other SEC opportunity has been there for Georgia and LSU and whoever. And on top of all of that, if you get Clemson, then the entire college football playoff as it stands right now, historically through the years that it's been here, you will have every one of the teams that you've seen the most in the college football playoff in one conference. So why doesn't the SEC form its own league, have its own college football playoff, do its own thing, and leave the rest to everybody else's problem? That's a good question. Uh, I see just me looking, and based on what you're saying and what you've said and pointed out, I see if the SEC is going after Clemson, and if they want them, they'll get them. Yeah. But they'll also get Florida State. Yeah. And probably because Miami. They want to beef up the Eastern Division of the SEC. And putting Florida and if I mean uh Clemson and Florida State in, you could then switch either Texas or Oklahoma to the east and switch either Clemson or Florida State to the West. And you still could keep up the rivalry between Florida and Florida State. You still could keep up the rivalry between Clemson and South Carolina. Because they're all SEC schools. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and, and it, listen, it makes perfect sense. I don't know a world where Clemson and Florida State don't jump, probably Miami. I don't know a world where that doesn't happen. There's only two major chips to fall left, in my opinion. And that's Clemson to the SEC and Notre Dame if they were to the Big Ten. And that would solidify everything. It would it would literally make three levels of FBS football. There would be the SEC and maybe the Big Ten together. And then it would be everybody else that's in FBS and then the FCS. So Division One would literally be split into three. And that first level would be SEC and maybe it would either be SEC or SEC Big Ten. The second tier would be the ACC, the American, the Sun Belt, the Big 12, the Pac-12, the Mountain West, you know, Mac, so on and so forth. And then you would have the FCS continuing to do what they're doing. But there would be three levels of Division I football, and that's just reality. And and so, I mean, that's that's how I see it. I don't see any other way that it doesn't happen in this respect. The Big 12 is trying to remain relevant. And if the Big 12 really is talking to four to six other schools, well, then they need to make a move and go after those schools. The Pac could have killed, could have helped kill the Big 12, and now the Big 12 can help kill the Pac-12, and that's what it looks like right now. I don't know what the Big 12 is waiting for, and it's funny because Greg Sankey, the commissioner of the SEC, he's out there saying, yeah, you know, I think we're okay with what we have right now. I don't think we really need to expand right now. And the new Big 12 commissioner, who, mind you, does not take his post officially until August 1st, Brett Yormark, he's out there talking. And what did Yormark say? He said, listen, we're all about expansion. We're talking to people. So you got Greg Sankey going, eh, 
I don't know. And he's taking that approach publicly. And then you have Brett Yormack, Yormark going out there saying, we're doing... We're, we're going to let you know publicly that I'm after it. Like, as commissioner, I'm letting you know we're having a ton of conversations. There's a lot of people interested. And so it's going to be our decision whether or not we take them. But they're calling us. They're talking to us. They want us. They want to be a part of our world. So I just find it really, really interesting that Brett Yormark is out there and his like first days of officially being a commissioner in the Big 12 haven't even happened yet. And he's already told the world, we are potentially coming after your schools and your conference. And then Greg Sankey's like, eh, I don't know if we're going to do that. But I think that ultimately the Big 12 should. And the SEC, they don't have to do anything. But I would be completely astonished if the SEC has not already talked to Clemson, Florida State, Miami, and some of these teams and said, hey, listen, let's figure out a way to feasibly make it possible for you guys. But why would Cle- if Clemson leaves the ACC, there's no relevancy in football. Wake Forest figured that out. Wake Forest won all these games. And the closer they got to the college football playoff, the college football playoff committee was like, we're never going to let you in. So, you know, Syracuse is never going to get in the college football playoff. Wake Forest is not going to get Wake Forest go 12 and 0. It doesn't matter. Syracuse go 12 and 0. It doesn't matter. It's not going to happen. The only ACC school that the college football playoff is interested in is Clemson. Now, maybe they would be intrigued by Florida State. Maybe they would be intrigued by a resurgent Miami. But the other schools, NC State's never going to get a seat at the table. Wake Forest is never going to get a seat at the table. BC's not going to get a seat at the table. Louisville's not. Georgia Tech's not. Duke's not. North Carolina's not. And you say to me, well, Dan, you don't respect them? No, I do respect them. I don't think the college football playoff committee respects them. And if you lose Clemson... I don't think the college football playoff committee is even going to register the ACC. And that to me is going to be damning to the ACC because the worst action again is inaction. Go after Maryland, bring them back, go after West Virginia because they have rivals rivalries with Pitt and Syracuse do. And then they, they have Virginia, Virginia tech right there. Do something to show that you have power because if you're not the ominous cloud, then the ominous cloud is eventually going to be over you. And the longer the ACC waits, the bigger that cloud gets from the SEC and the Big Ten, in my opinion. Uh, I agree with you. And uh, the SEC really doesn't have to approach anybody. No. They can, they can set that because other, those other schools are going to approach them. Can we get in? Is there any way we can work out something? Because uh, if, if the ACC continues to just sit idly by. Yeah. They're not going to be, like you said, they're not going to be considered for the college football playoff. The other schools are not. Clemson will be, and probably Florida State. And, you know, let's face it, Miami's only been to the ACC championship game, what, one time? Since they joined the conference. Yeah, but it's the Miami market that I think the SEC would like. I'm sure they would, but as far as the the championship series wanting to pick up Miami, I don't see them, the college football playoff committee, has that much interest in Miami. No, but Florida. I mean, but Florida State won the last. But you're right because Florida State won the last BCS national championship. Clemson's won numerous college football playoff championships. So I think Miami's enticing for the history, and they're enticing for the size, and they're enticing for the market and everything that that brings to it. And I think Clemson and Florida State are enticing because they both have won national championships. Right, and they will. Um, Florida State was a power for a long time, and. Yeah. Um, and they faded somewhat, but um, that, if they if they if Clemson is really looking strong at the at the SEC, and I think the SEC is looking strong at them, yeah, uh, uh, I think Florida State would would really be tempted to look to the SEC too, and and they would be considered. Uh, I, I agree with you to a certain extent that the SEC would like to have the Miami market, but they don't really have to have the Miami market. No, they're not. They're not as in need of the Miami market as far as revenue and is concerned as the Atlantic Coast Conference is. The Atlantic Coast Conference can't afford to lose the Miami market. Right. Um, 
They don't really want to lose Clemson, and they don't want to lose Florida State. But what are you offering them? I mean, what? Yeah. Uh, if Clemson is going to totally dominate the ACC every year, then what is the what is the the offer for them for FSU to stay in the in the Atlantic Coast Conference? Uh, we stand a better chance of being on television and playing top name, top ranked teams by being in that SEC on a regular basis. Yeah, you know. Uh, and I, I think there's a, listen. There's a lot of if the SEC calls you, you listen. I mean, I mean that's 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 how it is. If they're willing to look to bring you in, you listen. The other conferences still need to make moves. The Big Ten is still weaker than the SEC. They're still weaker. It doesn't matter what they do. They could take teams from all over the country. They're steam. They're 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 still weaker. The SEC has a footprint from Texas to Florida and up to Kentucky area, and they've stayed true to being a Southern conference. The Big Ten's just doing whatever they could possibly do. The SEC is not only the strongest conference, they still make geographical sense. They still don't have to travel 2,300 miles and go across the country to play. And and are you really going to send your women's tennis team over there? Are you going to send your men's lacrosse team? I mean, is this what you want to do, Big Ten, I guess? But, you know, ultimately for me, and are these kids going to go to class? I mean, if they have three games in one week and one's in California and one's in Pennsylvania, I mean, you're talking three time zones and and jet lag and, and people being just confused on what the hell's going on. This game feels like it's at three o'clock in the morning. This game feels like it's at two o'clock in the afternoon. Like there's so many issues the SEC doesn't have to deal with. And the American Athletic and the Sun Belt, mark my words, they did the right thing because they expanded and they expanded in the same footprint as the SEC. And if you look at where the Sun Belt is and you look at where the American Athletic Conference is, the American stretches out a little bit farther, but they both are right over the same area as the SEC. And if you take out them, if you take from the page of the SEC, I think you're going to be okay. I think it's going to work out. The ACC is in a position right now where if they don't move and they don't move quick and they don't do what needs to be done, keeping your teams hostage doesn't mean you have a strong conference. It means nobody can get out. And if they and if you have people that are there that want to get out, it's not going to be a good marriage. You know, you can lock somebody in your basement, but it doesn't make them love you. And I think yeah. that, that that's where we're sitting at right now, that the American, the Sun Belt, can look better than the ACC if they don't play their cards right. And there's a lot of open windows that we have to get into. And Carl, I'm definitely going to have you back. We kicked off ACC week here with Carl Haywood, extremely intelligent when it comes to this world, spent a lot of years, over four decades in the world of sports, CSRA Press Sports, talking all things ACC and beyond. I am more than honored and more than appreciative to have you on the show today, because as much as we tried to get to, we we barely scratched the surface, and that's because you gave me a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom, and a lot of layers that come from somebody who really loves the game and has really paid attention over the years. You know what you're talking about. You're a great resource, and I can't wait to have you back on the show. Well, I sure appreciate it, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity to just to sit down and talk with you. I gain a lot from you, too. And uh, you had a really good program, good questions, good opinions, and uh, we just want to do what we can to help. We're, yeah. we're trying to, to, to make it interesting and keep college football college football. Yep, what it always should be. So with that being said, I will see you in Charlotte. Please travel safely, and I look forward to talking with you soon. Yes, sir. We'll see you in Charlotte. Take care. All right, take care. That coming from Carl Haywood one more time here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets that thing called life. We'll take a quick step aside and bounce back to wrap up today's show inside the Cafe Kubal Studios right after this. This is a Wake Up Call Fast Break. Cafe Kubal offers same-day local delivery of our products, offering no delivery charge for Onondaga County. Shop CafeKubal.com for fresh roasted coffee beans, cold brew, travel mugs, and all your essential Cafe Kubal needs. Cafe Kubal, coffee for the soul.
Hi, this is Amy from Mother's Cupboard, home of the whole frittata. We are open daily, 6 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. For takeout orders, call 315-432-0942. And tune in to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora for our monthly food challenge and try our Wake Up Call signature menu item available seven days a week. Here at Mother's Cupboard, we are Central New York, and it's our honor to serve you. Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory remind us that every day is worth celebrating. Find them at 201 Old 7th North Street in Liverpool, New York. Open Monday through Saturday in store and all the time online at maandpazpopcorn.com. Serving our Central New York community and beyond, you can order all throughout the country at maandpazpopcorn.com. And remember to get your tins, which have in store half price refills forever. Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory available to you for fundraising and all of your events by calling 315-450-6272. That's 315-450-6272. Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory. How corny are you? Witty Wicks Candles and Gift Shop, Township 5 Camillus, where you will find handcrafted all-natural soy wax candles over 60 cents to freshen up your home. We carry a wide range of locally made items, Salsa Cues, Syracuse Salt, and Chocolate Pizza Company, to name a few. Let our knowledgeable staff help choose unique gifts and keepsakes for any occasion. Gifts for family and friends, and maybe a little something for yourself. Woody Wicks Candles and Gift Shop, Township 5, Camillus. In these unique times... There are those in our community that give us a sense of normalcy and positivity. Pizza Man on 50 Oswego Street in Baldwinsville has been here for you for over 35 years and is here now. Call 315-638-1234 or order online at pizzamanbville.com to bring those familiar tastes into your home. And remember to come see our monthly on-site broadcasts centered around the community and our Baldwinsville bees. Pizza Man in Baldwinsville. Any way you slice it, they are always here for you. This is Jimmer Sikowski, owner-operator of Chick-fil-A Cicero, 7916 Brewerton Road in Cicero, right in front of the Home Depot. I had a deep feeling that God wanted me to do something bigger with my life and to help people, help others. I kept putting Chick-fil-A in my life, and I realized as I was going through the franchise selection process that uh, positively impacting the lives of others was really core to what we do here at Chick-fil-A. First of all, it starts with the food. The food is brought in fresh daily, and we bring in local produce. We prepare to order in the kitchen. We hand bread our chicken. We hand spin our milkshakes. It's it's great food. It doesn't taste like fast food. I, I think the second thing is is the way people feel when they come in a Chick Fil A restaurant. It's different. We we try to treat people with intentional kindness here, which is very different and deeper than good customer service. And so, you know, I think it feels remarkable for most people to come in a Chick Fil A restaurant. And then lastly. The impact that we try to have in the community is very different. It's a big part of the expectation of every operator of a Chick-fil-A restaurant is that they're actively engaged in their community, they're a leader in the community, and they're, they're making a difference. When they realize that what we're striving to do is to shine a little light in their life, that's a very, very different experience uh, than you will have in any other quick service restaurant. And it's that remarkable experience that I think people will emotionally connect with. I'm George Townsend of Honda City with some good advice from buying a new car. The true cost of owning a new car is determined by the appraised value when you trade it. No vehicle appraises higher than a Honda. Next, look for low APRs and deep discounts. You also want low maintenance costs and great fuel economy. That's why my advice to you is to buy a new Honda. Looking pre-owned, visit our Honda Certified Used Car Center. Honda City, 7140 Henry Clay Boulevard, Liverpool, or hondacity-cny.com. I'm 
corporate purpose at Chick-fil-A is to glorify God by being faithful stewards of all that's entrusted to us and to possibly influence all those who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. And what became increasingly clear from our success in Cicero is that people love Chick-fil-A. And also, I think we recognize that, you know, we had a great opportunity to grow the brand and grow our platform. I felt incredibly grateful when I was, you know, selected to be a Chick-fil-A operator. I think what it's meant for me, what I've come to realize on a very deep level is that this is a calling for me. It's not a career. It's not a job. The Lord called me to be a Chick-fil-A operator and to use these restaurants to glorify Him and to positively influence other people. I'm blessed. I'm very blessed. Head to Chick-fil-A Clay on 3974 State Route 31 in Liverpool, New York. inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios where sports meets that thing called life. Proud to be here with you. Cafe Kubal, 3501 James Street, 324 West Water Street, and 401 South Salina Street, all in Syracuse, of course, on 343 Fayette Street in Manlius, New York, in their giant behemoth of a brown stripe building. It looks like coffee being poured. I call it the, Man the Manlius Welcome Center. It's a double-decker cafe where all roads converge into Manlius. You'll find it right there with an expanded parking lot. And, of course, their drive through on the corner of Route 11 and Taft Road at Sweetheart Corners in North Syracuse. I want to thank Carl Haywood from CSRA Press Sports for starting off, kicking off our ACC kickoff week, pun fully intended. Here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, we'll spend the rest of the week down in Charlotte, North Carolina. So make sure you're with us because we will change our times a little bit because I will be doing interviews during the day. But typically, Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora every single week, our regular time or Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You're on YouTube.com, Facebook.com and MixLR.com, all backslash WakeUpCallDT, as well as Facebook.com backslash LiveNowDT and on WakeUpCallDT.com's homepage. Once the shows go live, you can check them out in our archives. Search Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora or Wake Up Call DT as one word on Amazon Music, Audible, iHeartRadio, iTunes and Apple Podcasts, MixLR, Player FM, Podbean, Podvine, TuneIn, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube. So make sure you check us out there. And of course, a special thanks to all of our central and upstate New York partners and beyond. Cafe Kubal, Carvel DeWitt, the Wildcat Sports Pub, PB&J's Lunchbox, Canine Camp Dog Daycare, Avicoli's, Witty Wicks, Ma and Pa's Kettle Corn and Popcorn Factory, Pizza Man, Canine Camp Ground Dog Boarding, Chick-fil-A Cicero and Chick-fil-A Clay, Honda City of Liverpool and Mother's Cupboard. And of course, Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora is the proud multimedia marketing partner exclusively of your Lemoyne College Dolphins, your Marywood Pacers, and your Brian and Stratton College Bobcats of Syracuse. Check out Lemoyne on our Lemoyne tab on wakeupcalldt.com. Check out Marywood on our Marywood tab on wakeupcalldt.com. And Brian and Stratton on the BSC SYR tab on wakeupcalldt.com. And for our content with all of our exclusive multimedia marketing partnerships, make sure you subscribe to youtube.com backslash wakeupcalldt for all of them in one place. In the meantime, thanks to Carl Haywood. Thanks to the ACC. I cannot wait to see you in Charlotte. Looking forward to covering all 14 schools. So a big time shout out to all of them. Very excited in ACC week to be able to kick off the week here with you. With Boston College, Clemson, Florida State, Louisville, NC State, Syracuse, and Wake Forest all being this coming Wednesday, the Atlantic Division and the Coastal Division of Duke, Georgia Tech, Miami, North Carolina, Pitt, Virginia, and Virginia Tech on Thursday. I'll see you from here on out in ACC kickoff week down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And as always, please stay safe. You'll find all of our information on Facebook at Wake Up Call DT, Twitter at Call DT, and Instagram at Wake Up Call underscore DT. From inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios with the wonderful Witty Wicks, all of our signs here provided by Witty Wicks, and you can get all of these and more by going to their location in Township 5 in Camillus, right in front of Movie Tavern, 190 Township Boulevard in Camillus, New York. And of course, you can go to wittywicks.com. So, have a great day, be well, fill your cup up right with Cafe Kubal, and as always, God bless, no stress, do your best. Take care.